Okay, good day everyone. My name is Valentin Filipchuk. I am Webmaster Outreach Strategist in Google Dublin in, um, in Ireland. And in terms of my work, I consistently and constantly talk to webmasters in a webmaster forum, during live events, online and offline office hours, and uh, we try to help them solve their issues when it comes to Search Console or when it comes to Google Search in general. So as you can imagine, I have some experience uh, with the work developers must do to ensure their websites are indexable and findable by Google Search. But do all search engines see the, all the pages the same way? Or maybe some pages are more complicated or complex than the other ones? What about modern JavaScript websites and, and that pages? How does Google treat them? Well, today we'll be taking a closer look at what it takes for modern JavaScript power websites to be properly indexed uh, by search crawlers and especially by Google. So today I'm also excited to share a few news and a few tools that you can use yourself. We'll take a look at a new Google uh, search policy change. We will take a look at a new approach rendering HTML uh, to search crawlers and even a new tool for Google Search Console to help you with all that. It sounds like, like a lot, right? Well, it is, so let's just dive into it. For um, a lot of webmasters, Google Search is sort of a mystery. At times, especially on the topic of indexability, people wonder why do some web pages get indexed and others don't? Um, what's the difference between those pages? And will JavaScript render properly and be findable by the search crawler? And these are critical questions. And developers, as, as developers ourselves, we understand the frustrations behind that mystery. So today, we're going to pull back a curtain a little bit and uh, share some new pieces of information about how Google Search sees the web and how, about how Google Search indexes it. And uh, with this new knowledge and a few new tools, hopefully you will have concrete steps you can take to uh, make sure your JavaScript-powered websites are ac accurately visible in Google Search. Now, I want to remind you that this talk is about modern JavaScript-powered websites. And they are most often, oftentimes they're using one of these major frameworks. It could be Angular, it can be Polymer, it could be React, or it can be Vue.js, um, whichever who prefers. And actually, who doesn't love a web development framework that is easy to use, helps you build uh, your beautiful websites faster, and works great for the users? But it's important to recognize that some of these frameworks using are using the single uh, page app configuration, meaning that they use a single HTML file to put, pull the JavaScript from all over the place. And that approach can make a lot of stuff simpler. But if you don't watch out, JavaScript power websites can be a problem for search engines. So let's take a quick look at the default te template of a new Angular project and how it looks like. As you can see, the def default project template is pretty basic. It shows you um, that the Angular renders a header, an image, and a few links. It's very nice and very simple. But how could this be a problem for a search engine to index, right? Well, let's take a look behind the scenes and look at the HTML itself. That's it. Take a good look. When we view it in a browser, we see the default temp project text, uh, imagery, and links but you wouldn't know that looking at the initial HTML delivered from the server, would you? The initial HTML delivered from the server is completely devoid of any content. Just take a look at this. App root, right? Nothing more. Uh, that's all there is in the body of the page. For, for some search engines, they might assume that there's no content at all on that page, and um, that might be an issue, and there, there's nothing to index. And to be clear, Angular is not the only framework that uses this configuration. There are um, uh, other frameworks use the same logic by default and serve empty response by default themselves. Polymer, React, UJS, they have the same logic. So what does this mean for the index, from the indexability perspective for a website? Well, to answer that question, we need to take a step back and talk about web in general and why search engines exist and why search crawlers are necessary for them. Perhaps a good question to ask is how big is the web in general? We have spotted over 130 trillion 
documents on the web, which is another way to say, well, it's pretty, pretty big. Uh, and as you know, the aim of all search engines, and Google in particular, is to provide a list of relevant search results for a specific user query. And to make that mapping of user queries to search results fast and accurate, we need an index, similar to a catalog that we have in a, in, a, in a library. So given the size of the web, it's not an easy task. And to build the index to power our search engine, we need another tool, which is, which is Crawler. Traditionally, search crawler was uh, a computer with a piece of software that did two key steps. One aims to find a piece of content to be crawled. Uh, this piece of content must be retrievable via the URL. And once we have the URL, we get the content, content on this website, we sift through the HTML and index the page to find more links. And once we find more links, the cycle goes on and on and on. So let's take a look at the first step, crawling and try to break it down. So to ensure the crawling is possible, we have to keep few things in mind. Firstly, we need the URLs to be reachable, as in the crawler should not have any issue requesting the web pages and retrieving information from those web pages. Secondly, if there's multiple versions of that content, we need to know which one is the authoritative uh, version of that content, the original version of that content, and, and so that we don't misinterpret that content as a duplicate content from something else. And finally, our web pages need to have clean, unique URLs. Originally, this was pretty easy because we have a URL, we have an HTML, it's being rendered, it can be fetched by Google search. But things got much more complicated with the single app configurations getting introduced and with the modern JavaScript websites. And let's go over these concepts in more detail. First, for the reachability of URL, there's a very simple, very standard way to keep search engines, um, to give them a way to find your content, and you're probably all familiar with that method. Uh, if you add a plain text file called robots.txt, you can set certain, you say certain URLs to be crawled and certain URLs to be ignored. In this example, you also see that there are um, you can match those rules to specific user agents. You can set a specific user, user agent and match it to a certain rule. And in this example, we also see that we have a sitemap file which helps the search crawlers know which pages should be crawled first. And just to clarify a moment here, using a sitemap or adding uh, your, the pages to a sitemap does not guarantee that those pages are going to be crawled or indexed. It's just one of the signals that we use to, uh, to, to take a decision. Next, let's talk about duplicate content. Sometimes websites publish multiple versions or same content on several different platforms. For example, Webmaster publishes their blog post on their blog and then reposts it in Medium or other type of platform like that. That's called content syndication. And in order for a Google uh, search engine to know which is the original content and which is the duplicate version, um, there's a canonical metadata syntax that helps us identify with the authoritative source, source. And we call that authoritative source a canonical document, as you can see in, in here. Moving on to the cleanliness and the uniqueness of URLs. As I've mentioned, traditionally URLs was, were pretty simple. Uh, we have a URL, we fetch the content, render the HTML. But when Ajax appeared, it changed quite a bit of things. Suddenly, web pages could execute JavaScript without the reload of a browser. Um, they could fetch, fetch new content without reloading a browser, but developers still wanted a way to support back and forward navigation in the browser, as well as history support. So a trick was invented, which leveraged something called the fragment identifier. And its purpose was for deep linking into subsections of a content, like a certain section of an encyclopedia article. Because fragment identifiers were supported by browsers in, in history and navigation, this meant that uh, developers could trick the browser into fetching new content dynamically without reloading the page, and yet also have that old suite support of history and navigation. Um, but we realized that using the fragment identifier for two, diff two different purposes, to uh, linking into traditional URLs in a subsection of a page and into deep linking um, into JavaScript power websites, is not the most elegant solution. So we moved away from it. And instead, another approach was implemented. And 
which was to use the fragment identifier followed by an exclamation mark for deep linking. It was, called so it was also known as a hash bang trick. So that pretty much allowed to discern the difference between the traditional URL using the identifier and a deep link, right? Hopefully that, that's clear. And nowadays, however, there's a modern JavaScript API that lets us do this more gracefully. It's called JavaScript History API. Uh, it makes those old techniques less necessary, and we're going to see a few examples of how to use it. Um, history API is great because it enables managing of history state of a URL without requiring complete reloads, and it takes both from the both, both worlds. It also gives us a clean, uh, unique URL. And I can tell you from Google's perspective, we no longer support the hash bang trick, and we no longer uh, index that single hash workaround that used to work before. All right, that's crawling out of the way, sort of. So now let's move to the indexing step. Ideally, web crawlers want to fetch all content. Uh, and the core content is uh, text, images, video, as well as the hidden data, like uh, structured data, metadata, or uh, other things. Google Crawler also wants to fetch the dynamically generated, the dynamically fetched content, like uh, embedded uh, comments on Facebook or Discuss. Also, that might seem really obvious, but Google Search cares about the HTTP responses, especially about the 404 HTTP responses, because if a crawler comes to a page and sees a 404 HTTP response code, it's going to assume that there's no content to index there. It's not going to bother even indexing there. And lastly, of course, the crawler wants to find all those sweet links on the page as well. These, allows, these allow crawler to go further and continue the cycle. Now, let's take a look at those links and talk about them, because they're one of the most important, important parts of the web. I can't speak for all crawlers, but uh, in terms of Google, we only an analyze one thing, which is anchor tags with href attributes. That's it. This will not get crawled. This span will not get crawled. And this anchor also won't get crawled. But if we're using history API, as I mentioned before, to navigate the page purely on the client and fetch new content dynamically, then you can do that. Then it should be fine. Because most of the search crawlers, including Google, will not simulate navigation on the page and to find the new links. So make sure to have your anchor tags with href attribute there. But is that really everything? Well, not really. Because in order to I index that content, you have to render that content. That content has to be visible. If the content is not rendered properly, the HTML is not going to be visible. It's not going to be fetchable. Now, nowadays, that's not really the case. It, like, it's not that simple. So let's insert a step between crawling and indexing, because we do need to recognize that the search crawlers take on the rendering tasks as well. Otherwise, how else would they see the content? So modern JavaScript websites are rendering the HTML on the client itself, using like on a browser or be it a search engine. Just like Angular template I showed you before, if we're using the client-side rendering, the, uh, res the response that we're receiving from the server is going to be empty, not the response, but the content. Ultimately, those can be done either on the server or on the client. Potentially, a combination of those two can be used. It's called hybrid um, rendering, which we're going to talk a bit more um, soon. And uh, if we have a pre-rendered version of the content that's all nice and easy, Google Crawler can just come by and fetch that content. But things get difficult and complicated when it's client-side rendered. This is the challenge we're going to be discussing today. OK, so one last term before we move on to more technical stuff is uh, you might be wondering, how do we call our Google crawler. Well, we call it Googlebot. It's a, it's a nice little name. It was invented a while ago, and we, we like it. And we're going to be referring to it quite a bit in this talk. Um, also, I said that uh, search crawler used to be like one machine with, a, with, with code that was running on it. Now it's thousands of different machines with distributed software that is continuously crunching the data to understand that continuously expanding web. Now, let's think about those three key steps that we have, crawling, rendering, and indexing, and how they all connect. 
Because one crucial thing to recognize is that this is a cycle. It goes in cycle. And, um, or this is how it should ideally work. And uh, as you can see, we want all of those three steps to hand over instantly. As soon as the content is rendered, we want it to be fetched to, to keep the index as fresh as possible. It's pretty simple, right? Well, not really, especially due to the sheer amount of content on the web. But as you know, if a site is using client rendering, client-side rendering, this is not going to be the case, just like the rank, uh, Angular example earlier. So what does Google would, would do? Well, Google Bot has its own renderer, which is run when it encounters pages with JavaScript. But it does require quite a bit of resource to do it. So make no mistakes, this is a serious challenge for Google crawlers, Google Bot included. And so we come to an important realization that we want to share with you today, is that the rendering of JavaScript powered websites in Google search is deferred until Google Bot has resources available to process that content. Well, I'm pretty sure all of you are asking, well, what does that, what does that mean? Well, I'm gonna show you right now. In reality, Google Bot's process is a little bit different. We crawl a page, fetch a server-side rendered content, and do some initial indexing on it. But rendering a JavaScript power websites, as I've mentioned before, is a pretty resource-intensive task. So it requires a lot of resources. So, and Googlebot doesn't have infinite resources. No computer has infinite resources. So if the page has JavaScript in the rendering, then the rendering is deferred until we have more resources to render that client-side con rendered content. And then we index the content further. So in practice, that means that Googlebot might index some content before it's even rendered and before the final render can arrive. And the final render can arrive days later. When the final render arrives, then we perform another wave of indexing, which actually renders that final version of the content. So in practice, if your site uses a heavy amount of JavaScript client-side uh, rendered code, you could be tripped up at times when your content uh, is being indexed due to the nature of this two-step indexing process. Well, ultimately what I'm trying to say is because Google actually runs two waves of indexing across your content, it's possible that some details might get lost in the way. For example, if your site uses a progressive web application and you built it around the single page app model, then it's likely uh, all unique URLs share some base template of resources, which are then filled with content via the Ajax or fetch request when the page is loaded. If that's the case, consider, consider this. Did the initially server side rendered content include the canonical tags, the ones that we um, need to identify the original content? Because if it doesn't, then the second wave of client rendered indexing is not gonna look for that. So it, it is important to include that rel canonical rendering in the initial first wave of um, indexing, of, of, of indexing and rendering. Additionally, if you are requesting a URL that doesn't exist and you're using JavaScript to serve that 404 response code or that 404 page, um, it's not gonna be noticed in the second wave of indexing either. So it's important to serve those things like up front, server side. Now we'll talk about more of these issues a bit later, but what I wanted to highlight is though those are not minor issues. Those are pretty big issues that can impact your indexability. Metadata, canonical tags, HTTP resp response codes, those are all things that are key for Google crawler to understand the content on your page. However, just to be clear, not all pages need to be indexed. For example, if we take an example of Google I.O. sessions that we had recently, um, we, had a, we had a page for search and filtering, and we have a description pages for all the sessions. The thing that we really need to have indexed is the description of those sessions so that people can find them easily and know which session is the most interesting to them. So for that pages, it's important to have a server rendered page, uh, server rendered content, so that crawler can come in, fetch that content, and make it available. But for a, another 
piece of functionality, which is the search and filter interface, it's much more a tool than it is a piece of content that really needs to be indexed. So it's not as important to have that content um, included in the index. So ask yourself the question, does the content I really care about has the server side render? Can it be understood by search engines if, if it is powered by the JavaScript frameworks? So now you know. When building your JavaScript websites, you need to thread carefully. We work in a world where people are building webs who are building websites are oftentimes or most of the times not the same people who are promoting those websites. And this is a challenge, and this is a challenge that we're facing together as Google, as a Google, as a search engine, and as developers of an ecosystem that is continuously evolving. Because after all, you want your content to be indexed by search engines, and so do we. <sighs> All right. So as I've no uh, noted multiple times, indexing JavaScript websites can be a challenge, and a challenge for both Google and for developers. So we would like to help you to tackle that challenge in a more systematic way by providing three things here. A policy update or a policy change, a set of new tools that are available for debugging and troubleshooting, and sharing some of the best practices that should be used with the modern JS uh, websites. So we've talked about uh, client-side rendering and server-side rendering already, and um, client-side rendering is a traditional way of doing it, traditional state where JavaScript is rendered on the client or in the browser. For server-side rendering, we have pre-rendered HTML content that can be ser served to Googlebot, and we have pretty much no problems here. For both of these, um, in search, we index the state as it is seen in a browser. We'll try to render the pages as needed, but it's important to know that here is the third type of rendering, which I mentioned before, which is called the hybrid rendering. It starts the same way as a server-side rendering, where we um, preload the content, pre-render the content. However, there's more. On interaction, the initial, uh, yeah, the in or, or on the initial load of the page, the server adds JavaScript framework on top of that that can be executed on the client. As in with this, um, as with server-side rendering, our job is easy, um, and uh, this hybrid in hi hybrid rendering technique is something that we recommend long term. However, in practice still quite complex, and most from frameworks don't really make it easy. And a quick call out to Angular here, since we mentioned it in the example before. They have a new built-in hybrid rendering mode called Angular Universal that helps, uh, that, that helps with this. Over time, I imagine that more and more frameworks are going to be more keen to, adop to adopt those best practices. Uh, but until then, those cases can be tricky. So what's left? How we do we deal with modern websites? And um, how well does that work for search engines? There's another option that we would like to introduce. It's called dynamic rendering. In a nutshell, dynamic rendering is a principle where we pre-render, um, we serve the server-side rendered content to the Googlebot or to other crawlers. And we serve the client-side rendered content to the user, to the end user. So um, this is the policy change that we mentioned before. Um, you might ask, well, isn't this sort of a thing that we were very explicitly against before, like serving different type of content to the different uh, agents, one to Googlebot, one to the users? Well, this is a legitimate case, a legitimate use case. and. Uh, this is, uh, this is the change in the policy that I've mentioned before. We call it dynamic because it dynamically detects who is requesting that information. If the Googlebot is requesting that information, we can serve it the pre-rendered, server-rendered um, version. And for all other requests, like as in a request from regular users, we can serve them their uh, regular hybrid or client-side driven code. That gives you the best of both worlds and it deals with most of these uh, pitfalls that we've mentioned before. Know that this is not a requirement for JavaScript websites. As, you can see, as you'll see later, Googlebot can render them properly as already, most of them. And uh, for dynamic uh, 
rendering, if you decide to implement it, our recommendation is to add a new tool or step in your server configuration as, um, as in a dynamic <coughs> renderer itself. Uh, it's going to read your normal web content, handles the client-side rendering, and sends the pre-rendered version uh, to search crawlers and other uh, user agents like that. So how might you implement that? There are two ways of doing it. One of them is a framework called um, Puppeteer. Well, not a framework. Puppeteer Node.js module, which wraps the, he wraps the um, headless version of Google Chrome underneath. Another version is Rendertron, which can be used as software as a service uh, to do pretty much do, you know, to render and cache your content. Uh, both of these are open source. Are, uh, it's possible to make modifications and deploy it in your own build process. And um, it is an, an, a thing t you, you could potentially do. If you want to learn more about headless Chrome and how Puppeteer works, I strongly recommend going to the go into YouTube and uh, just searching for uh, headless Chrome by Eric Bildeman. That's the, the chief developer of that project. Or follow him on GitHub or wherever he posts his content. He, uh, this is a very interesting project. So let's look at the server infrastructure and how it looks like and how with the dynamic renderer integrated. So requests from Google bots come in and they can be sent to a web server, maybe through a reverse proxy uh, to, this to this dynamic renderer. There it requests and renders the complete, uh, the complete final version of the page. So without needing to implement and maintain new code, this setup could enable a website that has been designed with only client-side rendering in mind to perform the dynamic rendering of its content to Googlebot and other agents like that. And if you think about it, this would solve the problems that we mentioned before. Excuse me. No worries. <laughs> so yeah, having implemented that, we can be confident that the con our content will be uh, adequately and uh, would be available to Googlebot and will be seen how it's meant to be seen. So how do we recognize the Googlebot requests? Fairly simple. The easiest way is to have the user agent detection. And from here, we will be able to see that that's Googlebot coming into our website to cr crawl the page. And uh, if you want to make sure that this Googlebot is who it pretends to be, you can do a reverse DNS lookup just to confirm that everything is sorted and everything is good. If you serve adapted content to different uh, user agents, for example, um, um, one version of the page to mobile users, other version of the page to desktop users, um, make sure to use device, uh, device focused detection. Mobile search engine crawlers should receive the mobile version of the pages, while others receive the desktop version. If you are using responsive design, that's just one fewer things to worry about. Like it, that's the best practice that we do recommend. Now, what's not immediately obvious from the user agent string is that Googlebot uses the older version of Google Chrome, specifically Google Chrome 41. It was released in 2015, and it does not support a bunch of stuff, like a newer JavaScript version. For example, if we're using the uh, arrow functions that, that are in support, that, well, they are not supported by Googlebot, uh, as well as all the ES6 libraries that are not transpiled to the ES5. You can um, check these with the website caniuse.com, or you can install the older version of Google, Google Chrome, or more, to be more precise, Chromium 41, but we do not recommend that for obvious security reasons. Now, you might be thinking, that's kind of complicated, and that's a lot of work. Do I really need to do that? When do I need to do that? What kind of websites need to do that? So there are a few cases where dynamic rendering can be very beneficial. First, use it if your website is a large platform where content changes quickly and, and rapidly. For example, you have a news website that gets published all the time, and you need the uh, Google renderer to render them fast and index them fast. Second, if your functionality heavily relies on modern JavaScript functionality, as I mentioned, the uh, since, it's use, since Googlebot is using Chrome 41, if you're using ES6 syntax, it's not going to be understood by the, um, cert by the Google crawler, Googlebot. Oh, yeah. And also, um, 
we continue to recommend using the graceful degradation uh, in that case just to make sure that users can um, use the, fo the core functionality. Finally, this is not search specific, but if your websites rely heavily on the social media sharing or sharing uh, information in the chat apps, um, it could be done there. For example, if some of the services like WhatsApp or other things that want to extract structured data from your website try to do it, and there's no rendered content there, and they don't have a render built in, that's going to be just an empty, um, it's, it's not going to fetch a rich result for them. So when should we avoid using dynamic rendering? Well, the main question to ask here is, how do we balance the time and effort needed to implement that server infrastructure with the gains that we could potentially receive from it? We also should remember that the server side, rend like that the dynamic rendering is going to use up a significant amount of server resources. And if you see that Googlebot is already correctly interpreting your JavaScript website and uh, all the content is uh, already in the index, then you're probably fine with, with the current setup you have right now. So most sites should be able to let Googlebot render the pages for them, and rendering will likely improve on our end as well. So like I mentioned, if Googlebot can, man can render your pages correctly, you don't really need some to do a lot of extra steps there. But how do we make sure, how do we double check that rendering is done correctly? How do we make sure that everything is fine? So when diagnosing rendering, we uh, recommend doing it incrementally. First, checking the HTTP response codes, then seeing the rendered version on mobile, and then maybe even on desktop as well. So let's take a look at these. How do we do these? How do we diagnose these? The basic information like HTTP response codes is available through a tool in Search Console called Fetch as Google. So now I have a question. Um, who uses Search Console and who has their websites verified there? Okay, so one thing to take away from this session is make sure to add all of your websites to Search Console. It has a lot of tools to help you diagnose issues, troubleshoot them, get notifications, as well as um, improve the, the website in general. So once we have our site verified, we can use Fetch as Google to fetch uh, our pre-rendered version, see the resp response code, and see the HTML that has been rendered as a result. And basically, Fetch as Google is a tool that allows you to see how Googlebot sees that page. Once you've checked the raw response, I highly recommend using the mobile friendliness testing tool for rendering testing. It's a quite easy and nice to use tool. And um, it, as we can tell from the name of it, it checks how it looks on a mobile device. As some of you might know, over time, we'll be indexing content primarily with uh, Googlebot smartphone user agent. That means that we're moving towards the mobile first indexing. Did anybody hear about the mobile first indexing? Please raise your hand. Some people, okay. So it's especially relevant in relation to Google um, no, mobile first indexing to check those pages with mobile friendly test. We also recommend testing a few pages of each kind of page. Let's say you're an e-commerce site that has a lot of pages and you have the category pages, you have your home page, and you have your product pages. Select a few of them of each type, make sure to test them and make sure those are rendered properly. If your pages render well there, the chances are pretty high Coolbot is gonna render them well as well. A downside here is that you cannot actually use the website. You can see the screenshot of initial sort of paint that we see, but you cannot interact and see if the HTML is working properly there. So how can you check the HTML then? Well, we've added a new way to do it as well in the same tool. If you fetch your content, you are able to see source and see all the elements that have been rendered and the way that they have been rendered. So this rendered HTML is critical for double checking when you're using the uh, dynamic indexing, hybrid indexing, or something in between. But what do we do if the rendered page just doesn't work? Well, here is another new functionality that has been introduced. You can see a list, a list of resources here. For example, on, 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 on this screen, we see a list of resources that have been blocked by robots.txt. And um, 
as I mentioned before, not all resources need to be accessed in order to render that page. For example, and some tracking pixels really don't need to be rendered to uh, see that content. But if you're relying on an API to pull the content and that API endpoint is blocked in robots text, then it's not going to render. Also, an aggregated uh, list of all of these errors is also available in Search Console if you're interested. And also, when a page is failing to load in a browser, I would check the Developer Tools Console for, the for exceptions first. And uh, that's actually something that has been introduced in Mobile Friendliness Testing Tool as well. Here we can see um, a type of error that we've uh, caught and the actual source of that error. This allows you to check for JavaScript issues and warnings such as the ES6 features being used or just general issues uh, that arise when Googlebot tries to render JavaScript uh, pages. That makes life and troubleshooting much, much, much easier. But we've been talking about mobile quite a bit, but what about desktop? What about desktop pages? Um, for those, we should use the rich results test <coughs> where we can test the desktop rendering as well. This tool is meant for structured data validation originally. For example, if you have ra like rating stars or um, recipe cards on some sections of your website, you can test the validity of how it's being rendered there. But this tool is also really beneficial and useful to test the rendering of your desktop JavaScript uh, pages there. So now, how do we so now we've seen how we diagnose rendering issues and uh, we might have noticed some patterns. So now let's talk about the best practices that we should implement in order to avoid those. I've mentioned in the beginning of the presentation of lazy loading. Is this a safe thing to do? Well, it turns out that those are only sometimes indexable, depending on how la lazy loading is implemented in that specific case. Googlebot may be able to trigger it, and with that it may be able to see the uh, image of a URLs. For example, if images are above the fold and uh, all content above the fold is automatically loaded up when the page is open, then everything should be fine. However, if you just want to be sure that everything is OK, one simple approach to is to use a no script tag around those um, around normal image element. This gives the search engines the normal image and still handles the lazy loading for the users. Another workaround, which is very Google specific, is to use the structured data market. That way, you can handle this outside of the HTML body. As a side note for images as well, uh, we will not index images, images referenced through the CSS. We, curr we currently only index images in the HT, uh, HT, HTML IMG uh, tags. Apart from lazy loaded images, there are other design patterns that require interaction to load. For example, um, content and tabs that loaded on demand or infinite scroll. Uh, Googlebot generally will not interact with page, so we would not see those. So there are two ways uh, of uh, handling this for search. You can either freeload that content and the toggle visibility with the CSS, or you can use um, separate URLs that users can navigate to and see the content themselves. That way, Googlebot can find them and, and index it normally. And another thing to note is that Googlebot is a patient bot, but it doesn't have all the time in the world. It has a lot of pages to visit and a lot of content to fetch. So try to avoid the, um, first of all, try to make the performant um, fast web pages, which I hope all of you are already doing. And besides that, oh, no, no, no. Avoid, try to avoid artificial delays um, that hinder the page load. And you can use the tools that we mentioned before to use, use the standard tools like speed page uh, test for um, testing the speed and mobile first, uh, mobile friendliness um, testing tool and structured data testing tool for testing the rendering. Additionally, Googlebot wants to see the pages just like the user who, first, who comes to a web page and sees it for the first time. So make sure to not rely on any APIs that store something locally because we will not be able to see any of that. 
Yeah. And if you do use any of those techniques, again, make sure to use graceful degradation uh, to allow anyone to view the pages, even if those APIs are not supported. So that's it with regards to critical best practices. Now let's circle back our learnings and, and things we found out today. So we'll line our relevant points here. So first of all, double check the proper implementation of the best practices that we have just mentioned. Test a sample of your uh, web pages for rendering with the appropriate tools that we've also just mentioned. And if the site is large and quickly changing, or if you can't reasonably fix a uh, rendering issue due to the usage of modern JavaScript, consider implementing dynamic rendering, which would serve Googlebot the free rendered version of the content. Finally, if you do decide to implement the dynamic rendering, make sure to double check the results of that pre-rendered pre content. Also, keep in mind that indexing is not the same as ranking. But generally speaking, in order to rank, in order to appear in search results, the pages have to be indexed. I imagine everybody, or many people in the audience are asking, is it always going to be this way? Is, is anything going to change anytime soon? Well, as I've mentioned multiple times, this challenge is an important one. And at Google, we want the search results to reflect the web as it is, regardless of the framework that is being used or technologies that are being implemented. Our long-term vision is for you, the developers, to, is to make sure that you don't have to think as much about which version of the content to serve to which user agent. Thinking back at the diagram we showed at the beginning uh, with the deferred rendering, one thing that we do want to change is to make sure that the rendering is closer to crawling. Another direction is to let Googlebot use more modern version of versions of Google Chrome. Uh, but both of those are very likely to take a long period of time. And um, I don't like making long, short-term promises, but it's most likely not going to happen by the end of this year and probably later either. So similarly, we do trust that rendering will be more and more common across all web services. But at this, at this point, well, at that point, once that happens, hopefully dynamic rendering would not be such a... Um, critical thing to do for, for those modern websites. However, some of the, all of the, actually all of the mentioned best practices before, like lazy loading, would still keep being relevant. I think that covers everything. And with that, I hope you've seen enough appropriate tools and techniques that will allow you to build modern, powerful, fast JavaScript powered websites and make sure that, they, that those perform well in search. And if you have questions or you are troubleshooting and you sort of don't know where to go next, make sure to come by the webmaster forums where we help the webmasters who face similar issues or to come by on some of the online office hours uh, at google.com slash webmaster slash connect and check out the development documentation at developers.google.com slash search and uh, the rendering guidelines as well. Thank you for your time. I hope this was useful to you, and now we can leave some time for the questions. The question is, uh, are we working together with an Angular team and if, if we share the updates, right? Do I understand correctly? Uh, we are two separate teams. Uh, I am in Trust and Safety Webmaster Outreach team. So mostly we're talking to web developers and we are working with the search team. So as in the, the teams that are directly tied to search, to different sections of search. Angular is a different team. So we like it's, it's a separate thing from search. And in general, we like to sort of uh, have that very clear separation that search is a thing that is uh, kind of sacred for us. And um, we have very like small amount of team teams that actually work with search itself. So Angular is a separate thing and we don't share as much. However, we do have a team that uh, talks a lot with web developers specifically. 
and uh, implement the best practices. And uh, they do, they try to follow the best practices of the, the industry as much as they can. But they don't have any pref preferred or priority channel of communication with Google search team. Um, basically, everybody has the same access to the Google search according to the honest results policy. Be you a regular person coming from the webmaster forum or somebody who is a client, it doesn't matter. Due to the honest results policy, we support everybody equally and the same. So uh, to answer your question, <laughs> no, we don't work uh, very closely with, with, with that team, as in the search team with the Angular team. Yes, please? Um, I would test, always test. If you're using something, try to see if it's being rendered in mobile first, uh, sorry, in mobile friendliness testing tool. If it is rendered, perfect. If it's not rendered, take a look at what's rendered, what's not rendered. Um, you can also dig, dig, dig deeper into the code. The key thing here is to always test yourself because you know that developing JavaScript websites is very difficult to see what, you know, specific use case, but you can always test things yourself, debug them, and see where things go wrong. If they do. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe not about JavaScript websites. I can, s yeah, yes, please. Uh, regarding the content, is there something new in the way that um, the Google bots appreciates if the content is rich and interesting? Um, or um, do all practices are still the same? Uh, are you referring to the structured data markup? Yes, that, for example, but, but also the real content itself, the, the, the choice of the word you use, the way uh, sentences are the, mm -hmm. grammatically uh, formed, uh, mm -hmm. does, that, does all these things uh, still have an important impact on the way you um, rate uh, mm -hmm. the richness of the content of the website? So here, um, if, if I'm understanding the uh, question correctly, the question is much more about content quality and the way that it's written and the language that is being used. I would say that a great idea is to speak the same language with your user. If you're speaking the same language as your user, they would, you, you'll understand each other much better. So one mantra that we keep repeating in every single search conference is don't write content for search engines, write content for your users, create content for people who are going to read you. And that's the best possible practice that can be applied there. Think about who's going to be reading your content. Is it going to be interesting to them? Are they going to be engaged? Do they have a way to do what they came here to do? Make, it, make that process as simple for them as possible. Use the same language as they're using and analyze, analyze, analyze. Having that data there in Search Console or in Google Analytics, other tools, helps you understand your users way better. Try to track uh, user interactions, see what they're doing and where they're having issues. For example, they um, selected um, a certain good and then they, they realized they made a mistake and tried to come back. You can track and catch those things with Google Analytics or with the s several A-B tests. But again, it's up to webmasters what uh, to do what they want to do, but overall the best practice I would say focus on the user, use the user's language. Yes, please. Um, um, there's two, please. Um, as far as I understood this um, Angular universal, um, they pre-render the Angular on the server side and then sends all over the pre-rendered HTML with the client. Isn't this then a solution? Because then you don't need this dynamic rendering because then the client and also uh, the search engine already gets the, the pre-filled or somewhat. Somewhat, somewhat, because uh, on that step we said that the hybrid rendering, the Angular Universal, it pre-renders things, right? And um, it serves it to the search engine, which is already covers most of our things, which is already great. But then on top of that, it add, adds the client side things as well, so that users can interact and like, you know, do the things that they would usually do. Uh, the difference with the dynamic render is that they, the diff so 
if I understand your question correctly, what's the difference between dynamic rendering and hybrid rendering, and why would I need to use the dynamic rendering if I'm if I'm using hybrid rendering? Yes. Okay. So with uh, the hybrid rendering, we are serving the pre-rendered content both to users and to search engines. With the dynamic rendering, we are serving the pre-rendered content to a search engine and the client side rendered content to the user. That's the main um, difference. But, but you, can use the first option, the better one. you can use either of them. Uh, if, if it works for your specific use case, perfect. That, that works great. Uh, it's, it's an absolutely a long-term recommendation that we do recommend uh, doing in the long run. Dynamic rendering is more like a wor workaround in a way that we can, um, you know, make things visible. It does have speed advantages, absolutely it does have speed advantages. So it's up to you to choose whichever configurations you're more comfortable with, but it is one of the recommended configurations, absolutely. Yeah. You can use either, but uh, if, you, if you like hybrid one more, definitely use it. Uh, somebody else, yeah, you have a question. So that's The main thing is that the Google <coughs> that the, the sorry the search engine would understand it. That's um key thing there. But could you please clarify your question a little bit? Yes. Well, you should include uh, include all the resources that allow to to the for that page to exist. I mean, if you render it, if you pre-render it completely with a puppeteer, or with their rendertron, and it, it the layout is already there, then maybe it's not that wouldn't be that useful, right? But I don't think that would hurt either, to be honest. Like <laughs> the crawling. So we used to have the policy where we would require the content to be served to the user to be the exact same content that is served to Googlebot. But this is the policy change that I've mentioned there, right? So the policy change here is that you can serve the pre-rendered content for modern JavaScript websites to the Googlebot, and it's not going to be seen as a deception. As long as it's like, uh, I would say, uh, reasonable and uh, makes sense, you know? Common sense is the key here. Yes, please. Uh, there's two, two questions, yeah. Well, if you are serving the pre-rendered content, or uh, is the content uh, client-side or server-side rendered? It's just general. It's like everything on the server-side. Mm -hmm. And if you do the first uh, content cache, yes. you can then tell Google, okay, this is everything that we have. You don't have to come by again. You don't have to execute any JavaScript here. You don't even need to include that instructions. It's going to understand it anyways. If it comes by and fetches all the things already, then you're grand, you're, grand, you're good, you're covered. Second round, right. Yes, correct. So the second step. It's going to be done anyway. It's, it's, it's going to be done anyways. The second step is still like, uh, as I said, the resources would be deferred till it has more resources. But if everything is rendered on the first try, it's going to come by, see that everything is rendered, and then just leave, I guess. <coughs> 
most likely. So again, there's nothing to worry there. Like uh, as long as you're already serving the pre-rendered version to the first wave and you have your canonical tags there, the res HTTP response is great, then you should be good. But in general, highlighting again, testing tools are really great for that. Um, it's it's pretty smart. I'd say it's pretty smart in terms of that. Like it's it's uh, it's not going to stay longer than it needs, in the end. But you you, you can specify your crawling budget. But uh, I think it's an overkill and it's overcomplicating things. Yes, please. You had a question. Right. Right, so as I mentioned, this is the direction that we're going to be taking long term. Uh, but as you can imagine, the infrastructure upgrade of that scale is uh, pretty big, I'd, I'd say, yeah. But uh, it's going to take some time. It's definitely going to take some time. But um, it's, it's in, the, in the plans, I would say. No, no specific timeline to answer the question directly. Uh, Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned doing uh, reverse preamp lookups on right. the UI. Do you, uh, are you finding something to speak with that all, that there's a lot of people pending to do green bots and spamming? Or? No, not really. I'm just saying that if, if, if you want to double check, triple check, just to make sure, right. we, all, we all like to do that from time to time, right? Just, uh, well, I can't say that we we noticed a lot of things like that, so it's just for safety measures. All right, if you have any other SEO related questions or things like that, be happy to answer. Otherwise, I think we're getting close in terms of time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.